CBS News, 60 Minutes, Sunday on CBS. I'm always looking at where the story goes next. I hope that our guests come on and share something. For Americans, they're feeling it pretty hard. I know. That you will leave better informed, I can tell you that. Seeing the New York hush money case against Donald Trump has decided against delaying the trial or dismissing the case altogether. So ridiculous the cases, every one of them is ridiculous. I respect the appellate division for substantially reducing that ridiculous amount of money. If he's convicted, I will still vote for him because there's someone else running for office that should have been convicted a long time ago. Hello, I'm Caitlin Huey Burns in Washington. Welcome to a special hour-long edition of America Decides. Thanks for being with us. We are following significant developments in two legal cases informing, inform, involving former President Donald Trump, and both of them are in New York. First, there's a civil fraud case. A new a New York appeals court cut Trump's bond to $175 million. He previously had until today to come up with nearly a half billion dollars. And then there's his hush money case. A judge has scheduled a trial date for that starting April 15th, rejecting Trump's attempts for further delay. The re presumptive Republican nominee was in the courtroom for that hearing today. This is election interference. They are doing things that have never been done in this country before. We've never had anything like it, certainly not at this level, but we've really had nothing like it that I've been able to find. Robert Costa and Major Garrett join us now. Bob is in New York following that case, and Major is with me here on set. Bob, I want to start with you in New York. So we have this trial date set for April 15th, uh, the first trial of a uh, former president. Um, what reasons did the judge give in this hush money case to... Uh, start this trial date on this day. Caitlin, great to be with you. It's evident today, based on Judge Juan Mershon's comments inside the courtroom, that he wants this criminal trial of former President Donald Trump to begin as soon as possible. And he largely sided in his statements today with the prosecution, with the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, saying that while Michael Cohen, Trump's former fixer, was under federal investigation for several years, that the documents produced as part of that federal investigation were given over to the defense team, the Trump team, in as best a way possible by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Trump's lawyers have argued uh, in response that that's not true, that they need more time to review all of these federal documents that have come to light as the basis of that federal investigation. But the big picture here is that the judge wants this trial to begin in mid-April. It will begin in mid-April. And when one of Trump's lawyers said today in court that there's still going to be a delay, they're going to try to postpone this, the judge said effectively, I'll see you on April 15th. <laughs> well, that says that. Uh, Major, we know that a legal strategy from mm -hmm. the president's team in all of these cases has been to look for ways to delay these cases. In this case, we have the date. How does that impact Trump's ability to campaign? He's a defendant. He needs to be in the courtroom. When you're a defendant in the courtroom, guess what you're not, Caitlin? You're not a candidate on the campaign, campaign trail, whether you're the pre presumptive nominee of a major party or not, as Trump quite clearly is. For this calendar year, Caitlin, former President Trump has won the politics of indictment. It gave jet fuel to his candidacy for the Republican nomination. Many Republican primary and caucus voters who were wondering whether they would support Trump rallied around him, around the indictments, because they thought he was being treated unfairly. And some forces in American life and law were out to get mm -hmm. Trump. Now he's going to have to live with the reality of an actual trial. Indictments are one thing, a trial is another. And much of what former President Trump can say outside of a courtroom, in between proceedings, has political resonance and relevance. Yeah. All of that resonance and relevance becomes dissipated inside a courtroom because the courtroom is only considered concerned with three things, facts, law, and procedure. Mm -hmm. And in the courtroom, Trump continuously loses on facts, law, and procedure. Mm -hmm. He wins outside the courtroom mm -hmm. when it's an abstraction. Starting April 15th, 
This case will no longer be an abstraction. It will be a legal reality and the tables will turn. Yeah, and Bob, to that point, I'm curious if, you know, you were inside the courthouse today. Did you sense that this reality, this legal reality is setting in at all for the former president or members of his team? What was the mood like in that room? The actual revealing moment to me politically was the time I spoke. Okay. Ah, okay. I'm sorry. We have lost Bob for the moment. Uh, we will get him back as soon as we can. Um, but Bob, we were to our uh, major. We were talking about kind of um, this this mood that he was in. I mean, he came out afterwards and called all of this election sure. interference. Sure. We know this is not election interference. But how do you assess what he's trying to do here? So that is a typical Trump tactic. I've watched it play out for many, many years, a kind of political jujitsu. Use the momentum of your opponent to your favor. The former president is, whether you believe the January 6th federal charges are legitimate or not, the most visible figure in all of American political life interfering with the ratification of a presidential election result. No one has tried harder more publicly and more repetitively to deny peaceful transfer of power in the history of this country than former President Trump. Mm -hmm. So when he talks about election interference, he's trying to cast all of that blame that rests upon his shoulders mm -hmm. for actions he took intentionally onto some other forces in American political life. Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan District Attorney, it's not his fault that there were hush money payments to Stormy Daniels, Daniels mm -hmm. right as the 2016 campaign was reaching its crescendo. Who was in charge of that scheme, according to the documents and the indictment? Michael Cohen and then candidate Trump. When payments were made to a fictitious legal entity created by Michael Cohen when Trump was president, those checks were signed where, Caitlin? In the Oval Office. Is Alvin Bragg responsible for that? No. He's bringing a case based on those facts. The timing of the case is inconvenient for Trump, but the underlying offenses, as alleged, mm -hmm. were his doing, not the district attorney's. And we have seen Republicans, you know, co-opt that phrase, election interference, and apply it blanket to anything that they do. To whatever fits. Exactly. Yeah. A narrative of some forces in American political life's tampering with mm -hmm. the way voters would otherwise judge an election. Yeah. But let's yeah. be candid. Voters will judge the 2024 election in part on what mm -hmm. former President Trump did with the 2020 election, mm -hmm. whether he's comfortable with that or not. Mm -hmm. Things we've seen. Um, Bob, we did cut, you did cut out, so I wanted to let you finish your thought about what you found most revealing about Trump's appearance today. Apologies for my microphone. Uh, now that it's back, I can report, based on my, <laughs> uh, my time today in Lower Manhattan, that I saw Trump up close today inside 40 Wall Street. It wasn't just the courthouse. He had a press conference afterward. And I stood just foot, a few feet away from him and asked him a question about how he's going to pay this bond. He told CBS News he has a lot of cash. He's going to be able to pay this bond, secure it on time. But what was so interesting to me as a political reporter, put aside the legal aspect of all of this, is he spent the first 10 minutes, let's say, of the news conference really outlining his view that he's angry with President Joe Biden, angry with the Justice Department, angry with the prosecutors in lower Manhattan. He's angry with this uh, attorney general of New York, Letitia James. And his grievances are fueling him politically. And when he was asked by reporters if he believes a conviction in the criminal hush money payments trial could affect him, he, actually, he said it could actually help me. He believes that many Americans will look at this process that he's facing and galvanize or at least be sympathetic toward him. Now, that's a very much TBD prospect politically. It's, it's hard to say any political strategist, red or blue, would want to see their candidate face a conviction during the heat of an election season. But that said... Trump has often used controversy as fuel for his campaigns, which makes him such an unusual political actor on our national stage. And, Bob, I know when you've talked to him before, too, he said that the courtroom is the campaign. That, oh, it is. You know, and, and, and as Major and I were just discussing, according to the timeline here, it very much is going to be where he is and the only place that he can kind of campaign. Um, do you feel like they believe that still works to his advantage, or are they kind of internalizing what we were discussing earlier about the realities of what this actually means? It's complicating the political calculus 
for 2024? Because so often we'd be talking about issues like the economy, like the border, like character, perhaps to a point. Mm -hmm. But it's Trump's character and conduct that's so front and center due to these ongoing trials and the civil fraud case that it's, it's really pushing to the side so many issues that would usually be cropping up at this point in a general election campaign season. And that could hurt Trump. It could help Trump. It could be a wash. It could be a distraction from the ultimate drivers of what's going to happen in this campaign. But we're in an unsteady political moment where it's so unclear what exactly this all means. If Trump has to pay $175 million, is that a one-week story? Or do people say, for the rest of this campaign, the state of New York really believes this, this person's a fraudster and we don't want to have them as president? Or is it just another controversy that circles around Trump? Trump's betting on the latter. But at the same time, the Biden campaign is looking at all of this and saying the January 6th issue, democracy, hasn't even come to the fore yet with Jack Smith. All of these could ultimately be a weight on Trump. But no one's really sure about how it's going to play out because we're not having a traditional campaign. Yeah, not a traditional campaign. The understatement of the 2024 <laughs> campaign, indeed. Um, Bob, thank you very much for sharing your reporting from the scene today. And Major, stick around with us. You'll be yeah, here uh, with much more because we have some expert legal analysis on these challenges facing the former president. That's straight ahead on this special hour-long edition of America Decides. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. If China invades Taiwan, what will the U.S. Navy do? Here in Tel Aviv, second siren about to end. This Humvee just pulled up and said, it's time to leave. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm going to use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Original documentary from CBS reports tensions rising between a powerful country and a vital island. The supply of this technology came grinding to a halt. The world would grind to a halt. Absolutely. As Taiwan faces threats and aggression. Taiwan is on the front line, and we understand our responsibility as a democracy. We cannot fall. CBS News examines whether they can defend themselves. Putin, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, they are manifestations of the battle between autocracy and democracy. And that is a fight that we're all engaged in. Defending Taiwan, now streaming on the free CBS News app. When weather turns extreme. Record-breaking storm surge and devastating wind. Every second counts. The mud punched a hole right through the wall. See, hear, feel the forecast. Tonight on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. They are doing things that have never been done in this country before. You had a, you have a case which they're dying to get this thing started. 
The judge cannot go faster. He wants to get it started so badly. Welcome back to America Decides. That was former President Trump this afternoon reacting to news that the hush money payment trial in New York will begin officially on April 15th. For more on this, let's bring in Notre Dame law professor Derek Muller. And Major Garrett, of course, is here with us again. Uh, Derek, good to see you. Thanks so much for being here. Um, you know, Trump earlier today said that this is all political, uh, that it is unfair, in his words, to have a trial in the middle of an election. So I'm curious kind of how you would assemble an impartial jury for the trial of a former president. Of course, we've never been here before. No, we haven't. Um, we've never had a former president indicted like this. Uh, then he's running for re-election, so that complicates things. He's been running for re-election for well over a year. It's a very public case, so voters and potential jurors know what is potentially in the air, what's in the water, and we're trying to find out uh, when we voir dire the jurors, prospective jurors, are they going to be impartial? Are they going to be as fair as possible? And are they going to be able to hear this evidence with an open mind and before they convict somebody? It's going to be a, a very challenging affair from the very beginning of trying to navigate this trial. Professor, it was said when the Manhattan District Attorney was contemplating these charges that if he brought these felonies, it would be kind of a leap or a stretching of understood law in terms of misdemeanor and felonies. Is that true based on what you reviewed of this trial as it moves closer to actual courtroom procedures? Yeah, one of the things you mentioned in the earlier segment was how Trump keeps losing a lot of cases in court. And it's interesting to watch this one because I think there are going to be some challenges for the prosecutors here. I mean, a lot of these business falsification and documents cases, usually they bring an additional charge beyond just the falsification, like larceny, something like that. We don't have that here. We just have the business falsification. And they can't just say that he falsified business records. It had to be falsification with an additional crime underlying it, such as a violation of federal election law, which is a little strange because this is a New York state proceeding referring to federal election law. It's actually deeply unclear whether hush payments are a violation of federal election law. Um, John Edwards, former North Carolina senator who ran for president, um, also was accused in federal court years ago of paying hush payments to a mistress, um, those cases were thrown out. And so there's a, there's, a, there's a question about whether or not this will proceed. So lots of complicated questions for, for the prosecutors, but then a lot of things that, that Trump and his team are going to have to defend in these novel charges. Yeah, I'm kind of curious about that lack of a legal um, roadmap, if you will, because we've not been here before. Um, how do you assemble witnesses for this kind of thing? What would that look like? Yeah, so here we're going to be trying to trace out from Michael Cohen or his associates about the money that was being gathered and the use for it. I think everyone agrees that this was hush money, right? This was used to silence the uh, former porn pornographic actress who maybe Trump had an affair with and has denied. But we have the money just knowing that those things swirling around could have damaged the campaign. So we're going to be trying to find people who had heard of this affair, people who were aware of the money that was going through. But, but again, we're dealing a lot of records, a lot of documents, a lot of sort of forensic accounting experts, if you will, to talk about these things. And then it's going to be this question about getting into Trump's state of mind. Did he know he was trying to cover something up? He was trying to conceal it. There was this legal question there. It's always the problem in these prosecutions is to get into uh, the defendant's state of mind. And so we'll see what the prosecutor uh, has to show next month. Professor, for those who watch today's proceedings on the reduction of the bond that the former president has to put up in order to pursue his appeal of the civil fraud case, the separate case, not the one dealing with Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels, they will ask themselves, did Trump win something today or was it sort of uh, a temporary victory? How would you assess that? It's only a victory, but I would qualify it as you did as a temporary victory. Uh, it's pretty rare for a bond like this to get reduced on appeal. The point is, once you've lost uh, a case at the trial court level before you can appeal, we want to make sure that you have the money in place and you're not just postponing everything. We want to be able to wrap this up if the appeal doesn't have any merit. But this is a huge, huge award at $454 million. Very rarely do we see awards reduced. But in cases, you know, I think of one from the 80s involving some oil companies and the billions of dollars, those are the kinds of things that get reduced. So the reduction to 175 million, right, that's not 
That's not uh, chump change, right? That, that's a significant sum that Trump's team is still going to have to come up with. Um, so a temporary victory that he doesn't have to be on the hook for the full $454 million today, um, but something short-lived as that appeal is going to press forward and probably press forward fairly quickly. And is there any chance that that could be further reduced? It is. So one of the things in appeal, right, is to figure out whether or not that size of the award was justified by the evidence. And so one of the things that Trump's campaign is going to be arguing at first is that he wasn't liable. But second, that even if he is liable, that he didn't inflate the value of his assets to such a significant degree that this amount of money is what he should be on the hook for. So he will be pressing both whether he's liable and the amount of liability on appeal. So again, it's a good sign that the New York Court of Appeals here is allowing that to be reduced right now. Um, I wouldn't read it too much into it to say that they're going to reduce it in the future, just that as a temporary matter, given the size of the award, they're going to reduce it only to let him appeal so they can hear the case. All right, Professor Derek Muller, thank you for explaining this in terms we can all understand a lot to unwind with all of these different cases. We appreciate your time. Well, thank you so much for having me. And former President Trump is using his legal troubles out on the campaign trail. What voters are making of his cases? You're streaming America Decides. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. Nate has one of the quickest minds I've ever seen. Tony has a way of making people feel comfortable. Gail has this unbelievable knack to ask the question that you're asking at home. I've been told I could talk to a tree, and that's pretty much true. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7. It didn't seem like anything could happen. Because nothing ever happens in East Palestine. But it did. Authorities released toxic fumes from five derailed train cars. Resident, please evacuate. Acute bronchitis due to chemical fumes. Did you ever have these problems before the derailment? No, ma'am. This neighborhood's not safe no more. We can assure the community that there's not vinyl chloride entering their communities. Then why are there so many people feeling these various symptoms of bloody noses or difficulty breathing and bronchitis? That's a hard question to answer. We're talking about one of the most blatant releases of a mixture of some of the most toxic chemicals that we've seen in America. I feel like now I have a duty to warn other communities. If my daughter has to watch me die of cancer, at least it saves someone else. This case. It's like a screenplay, something straight out of Hollywood. But it's not fiction. It's 48 hours. Human remains found this week. Four families shattered. There's no physical evidence. The mystery would haunt investigators for years. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Get it, Like a John Grisham novel. A gripping true crime original. 48 hours. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. This is CBS. that come with the territory. There have been four fatal accidents. That's a 1% fatal accident rate. Might make you look before you launch. If you had one out of 100 airplanes falling out of the sky, we'd have a public crisis. Space Tourism, now streaming on the free CBS News app. If he's convicted, I will still vote for him because there's someone else running for office that should have been convicted a long time ago.
Welcome back to America Decides. Many Republican voters, as you saw there, in key battleground states are standing behind Trump amid his mounting legal troubles. With a hush money trial set to start in April, the presumptive Republican nominee is going to be spending a lot of time in that courtroom ahead of November. So for more on this, we have Finn Gomez and Katrina Kaufman. Finn is here with us on set, and Katrina is outside the courthouse in New York. And, of course, Major Garrett is with us as well. Um, Finn, uh, I want to start with you because we've been kind of talking about the politics of this. And sure. we know, as we've talked about for several months now, that the court play cases, um, you know, play heavily into Trump's campaign. But I'm curious how this specific one may play in. How seriously are they taking this hush money payment case? Well, you know, actually, you talked about battleground states earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a poll that came out about a month ago, a Bloomberg poll that showed that uh, if convicted, over 50 percent of voters in those respective states, we're talking about uh, from Arizona to Wisconsin to North Carolina, Georgia, and so on, that the 50 over 50 percent, 53 percent would not vote for Trump, mm. according to this poll, if he is convicted, and 23 percent of Republicans as well. The other thing is we've never been here before. This is yeah. historic. We have never had a candidate, a nominee, excuse me, from a major party Facing criminal charges, this is this is historic and weird. We have never been here before, so th this is something that, that that that's the big question. How will it impact the, the his voters, his support, and those battleground states? I mean, that's a really important point because that's speaking to what we were talking about earlier: the primary versus the general election. Because we saw in the primary over and over again, vast majorities yeah. of Republicans were saying they'd support him if convicted. Now you're in a general election climate. That's not the case. Necessarily. Right. There's no strategist that Trump can turn to and say, hey, how was it handled before? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> there is no before, Mr. There, President. There, there is no. So you are the author of your strategy. Right. Kind of like he was in 2016. And that, as you well know, Finn, is Trump's natural, most comfortable place. He's his key strategist. His gut instinct is what rules almost all of his political calculations. Yeah. And those closest to him carry out his instincts. But it's all instinctive, and that's what he's got to go on right now. Right, it's that whole that notion that we major that in CHP that we know so well from 2016. It's like let Trump be Trump, and right now that's what they're that is their their compass politically. Mm -hmm. You know that is what they're going on. How this plays, in, especially in those seven battleground states, that is where this this election will, will be decided in those seven states, and how that's playing. We, we're seeing some voter sound. How that's impacting. Those voters, that's really just his, those are those are his supporters, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a soft partisan, Trump, I've been told, is, is big on the suburban voter. Mm -hmm. Like how would this, you know, they're really going after the suburb, suburban voter. You would imagine day in and day out for weeks of uh, being, uh, being coupled on a headlines with an adult film star, being reminded of, uh, of these accusations that, ha that occurred back in 2016. Like, it is, it is bringing up stories, negative stories, that they don't want, the campaign does not want. How is that going to impact the voter? Katrina, one of the many obligations you have for us, and we are indebted to you for carrying them out on such a consistent and quality basis, is keeping track of the calendar. And it is a hectic and crowded legal calendar for the former president. We're not going to impose upon you every single thing that's on that calendar, but give us a flavor of the next couple of months, if you could. Sure. So this will be the first criminal trial to move forward against Trump. This hush money case, it is now, as of today, officially set to start on April 15th. It will end up intersecting with arguments that are going before the Supreme Court and this is Trump's immunity appeal that's related, related to his D.C. election interference case. Now, the Florida classified documents case was set to start on May 20th. The hush money case will likely actually go to late May at this point. But in Florida, we're also really still waiting for a final trial date from Judge Eileen Cannon. She hasn't fully set that yet. So really, it could be a very crowded summer. There's the Florida classified documents case the Georgia election interference case, and potentially the D.C. election interference case that all may want to try to start. But it's plausible that this hush money trial will be the only criminal prosecution that actually gets completed before the November election at this point. And Katrina, we were talking earlier about how the strategy from Trump's legal team in most of these cases, if not all, has been to try to delay the proceedings in any way they can. Why was it not successful today? Judge Juan Marchand seemed very frustrated today at this attempt to delay the proceeding, and, and not just to delay it. Trump's team was actually trying to get these charges dismissed. 
Essentially, the hearing was about a trove of last minute discovery that came to light. And Trump's lawyers were saying that it was really DA Alvin Bragg's responsibility to request this evidence sooner. And that because he hadn't, this could actually be prosecutorial misconduct, misconduct that was of a level that would be enough to dismiss the entire indictment. But the judge was not swayed at all by Trump's legal team's arguments today. And this trial is going to move forward as planned. So in thin. fact, he actually okay. said that the DA's office went above and beyond in their effort to get evidence for the defense. Sorry about that, Katrina. Uh, Finn, one of our campaign reporters, Torian Small, was in one of the battleground states, Wisconsin, talking to Trump-aligned voters about all of this. Let's take a quick listen. They're going after this man, for whatever reason they are, for trumped-up charges when they can do the same thing to the other person they're not doing it. I mean, look at Biden and his son. To me, if any of that is true, there's legal issues out there on that side that are absolutely ridiculous. That is a kind of microcosm of the Trump supporting Republican world, that whatever the former president is alleged to have done, even if true, is either counterbalanced or less severe than the allegations which have resulted in zero criminal charges against former President Biden and some criminal charges against Hunter Biden being prosecuted under the leadership of the Biden Justice Department, we should note. Right. That is a healthy sign for Trump, at least among core Republican supporters. Is yeah, it not? Absolutely. They're, they're not going to erode. I mean, talking to a Trump advisor, they, they say uh, just a little while ago, they say that this plays right into that narrative. You know, this is the political witch hunt. We've heard, you know, we heard the former president in New York City just say the same thing a little while ago. Uh, you know, it's, it's a political persecution. Uh, you know, that plays well. That resonates well. What, what we don't know mm -hmm. is that Nikki Haley voter. What we don't know, we heard Mike Pence, who just said his own, own vice president, a little, you know, tell, tell uh, Margaret Brennan face the nation a couple weeks ago, that he was not going to support his, his, his own his former running mate. Like, where does that voter go? Where does that, like, traditional conservative Republican voter go? We all remember in 2022, if it's an example for this, perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't. But if we look at that Senate race, that key Senate race where that McCain Republican voter helped, helped the Democrat win, mm -hmm. will the same thing happen here in November on a macro level? I mean, that's a question that I think should, uh, should we all should be asking. And as we've been talking to voters throughout this campaign, a lot of them, Republicans, have called a lot of these trials a distraction and they're not really paying attention. The Biden theory of the case, of course, is that they are going to spend a lot of time in some ways reminding them of everything associated with Trump. So we'll see if that right. uh, strategy pays off as well. Ben Gomez, thank you very much. And Katrina Kaufman in New York, thank you. We appreciate your time. And coming up next, the fate of abortion medication is in the hands of the Supreme Court. We're going to discuss the legal ramifications of Tuesday's oral arguments on mifepristone access and how this may affect this year's election. You're streaming America Decides. Washington is the seat of power. Um, national security, foreign policy, global economics, every story comes through Washington in some way. We bring some of the most powerful voices in America to the table. We don't just ask the questions, you have to go deeper. We try to understand what's at the heart of the issue we're talking about to then come forward with solutions. Face the Nation on CBS. The justices ruled that Harvard and the University of North Carolina violated the Constitution. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision to end affirmative action in college admissions, uncertainty sets in for some students of color. Affirmative action really gave us an equal opportunity. CBS Reports explores the historic decision and what it means for those chasing an opportunity to change their lives. I knew that college was the ticket to break this cycle. The end of affirmative action, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Okay, let's go. You guys good? Hey. All right, we good? Keep going. It's the clock. It's ticking. Off we go. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. It's time for 60 Minutes, Sundays on CBS. 
An original documentary from CBS reports. AI is among the most world-changing technologies ever. Curing diseases, scientific breakthroughs, making lives better. It can help us with medical discovery, scientific discoveries, doing better agriculture, having cures for things like Alzheimer's. It's also going to really transform the way we work. The uplifting potential of artificial intelligence is limitless. It gives you a friend, somebody to chat with 24-7 that is non-judgmental. He makes me feel loved and desired. And so are its downfalls. The problem with all this AI is that it's unpredictable and uncontrollable. The choices we make now will have lasting effects for decades, maybe even centuries. The ChatGPT revolution, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We are about to see American weapons in the hands of Mexican cartels. A gun pipeline to Mexico. We are arming the cartels. 100%, no doubt about it. Happening right under our noses. Uh, who's doing something about this? Nobody. A CBS Reports exclusive. Most Americans have no idea that we are effectively arming the enemy next door. This is the story the American people need to know. Arming cartels, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education, both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bring you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides, Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. You overrule too many cases and law will turn into chaos. And before you know it, you won't know what the law is. Welcome back to America Decides. That was former Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer weighing in on the direction of the court. His comments come as justices prepare to hear oral arguments about legal access to the abortion drug called Mifepristone. The FDA says at least 5.9 million women have used the drug since its approval back in 2000. We are joined now by James Ramaser and Shauna Mizell. James is a legal editor for Politico, and Shauna is one of our CBS News campaign reporters. And, of course, Major Garrett is here with me as well. <laughs> uh, we should uh, just, we're fitting four people on set, so this is great. James, let me start with you. Um, what is at stake in this decision? Can you describe how we got here? What's actually in dispute? So what's in dispute at the court on Tuesday is a series of policies that the FDA enacted in 2016 and in 2021, essentially to expand access to mifepristone, which is the primary abortion drug that is used as part of a two-pill regimen for the majority of abortions in America today. And what those policies did, among other things, was allowed women to receive the drug via telemedicine appointments rather than coming in person to a doctor, to receive the drug by mail rather than picking it up, to um, expand the approved usage of the drug from seven weeks of pregnancy to 10 weeks of pregnancy, and it also allowed uh, nurse practitioners to prescribe the drug rather than just physicians. So it dramatically did expand the scope of access, and now the challengers to those policies are seeking to roll back those policies and roll back the access to the drug. And, Sean, if the Supreme Court agrees to that rollback, what's the practical effect in a already transformed abortion access landscape in America? This could have huge and wide-ranging implications across the United States, even in states where voters went to the polls and supported reproductive rights and enshrining the right to an abortion into their state's constitution because that access to mifepristone would be threatened based on however these justices rule. I mean, I think that's such an important point here, that this would affect um, people in places where abortion is legal. I mean, we have such a patchwork of laws, so um, access depends on what state you live. This could uh, potentially change a little bit of that. Um, I'm curious, too, uh, James, you know, we heard from Justice Breyer. Uh, uh, Breyer he has a book out, uh, so he has been uh, talking a lot about the court uh, lately. Um, and you heard him in there talking about how the court has been overruling too much. I'm wondering if that should be at all considered in, in this case. Well, in this case, there's no particular precedent at stake like there was in the Dobbs decision that mm -hmm. rolled back the constitutional right to abortion two years ago. Um, it is, in a sense, unprecedented in the sense that this has never really been tried before. Mm -hmm. There's never really been a challenge to the FDA's policies about access or approval of a particular drug. 
And what the FDA has said, what the Biden administration has said, and what the pharmaceutical industry is saying is that if the justices allow these challenges to succeed, we will open the floodgates, the court will open the floodgates to all sorts of challenges, to all kinds of FDA approvals of any kinds of drugs that people have strong feelings about, like birth control, like IVF, like um, vaccines even. Mm. And um, it's never really been allowed before by courts, but this would in a sense, open a floodgate well beyond abortion. And Sean, uh, to that point, there is a long history of use of this particular regimen of two drugs, as James outlined. What's that history, and what is the pushback on this idea that there is something materially unsafe about this particular drug regimen? Yeah, so mifepristone has been approved by the FDA for more than 20 years, and so that's really what's under the scope now. And as he mentioned, it's used in a majority of abortion procedures, and so that's really what people are going to More than to half, do. about six, just 60 under 60 percent, something. right? Yeah. yeah. And so a lot of women who have gone in abortion <laughs> procedure have used this drug, but as well as women that have, you know, struggled with miscarriages, this is also a drug that's used in that process as well. So... It is something that has an established track record of safety within the confines of that definition, correct? Absolutely. So the safety isn't what's under scrutiny. It's those FDA regulations that they rolled back and relaxed some of those requirements, being able to mail it, as you mentioned, allowing nurse practitioners and other health care officials other than doctors to be able to prescribe this medication. Those changes, some of them occurred during the Trump administration, did they not, James? 2019? No, 2016 and 2021. 2021, okay. That's right. So it was the Obama administration and the Biden administration. Biden administration, got it, okay. And, you know, we're, uh, all of this is coming, of course, in an election year. So we are looking at kind of the political ramifications of this. Um, I know Democrats are obviously, have been talking, I know you've been talking to uh, campaign uh, sources on the Democratic side. I'm curious how they are weighing this. And also, has Trump weighed in on Mithapristo? So, as James mentioned, the Biden administration, Biden in his official capacity, has said that he stands by the FDA. But the Biden-Harris re-election campaign held a press call this morning on Mifa Pristone, specifically about this upcoming hearing, where they really sought to tie this to Trump. They emphasized that he appointed three of the Supreme Court justices who will be hearing these arguments. And these justices also supported overturning Roe versus Wade with the Dobbs decision. Trump himself has really not spoken out on this. That remains to be seen. But as you said, all of this coming during election year, and as we are expecting former President Donald Trump to come out and announce his policy on a national abortion ban, where he would draw the line as it relates to a time period, 15 or 16 weeks. James, as you're well aware, there are conservatives who take issue with the quote-unquote administrative state. They think the bureaucracies and agencies such as the Food and Drug Administration overstep either congressional letter of the law or the history of the application of their regulatory power under that letter of the law. Do these changes in 2016 and 2021, to your mind or to the minds of other experts, create some sort of basis to say the administrative state has kind of run amok here? Well, I do think that it's possible that some of the justices, the conservative justices, will see it that way. And there's already been a series of cases this term involving so the Supreme Court's concerted effort to chip away at the power of federal agencies. And so I do think that that theme does lurk in the background. However, this case is about abortion, and any time a case involving abortion comes before the Supreme Court, it's about abortion. And justices tend to put aside their feelings on other aspects of the law, like whether that be textualism or originalism, or their feelings about the administrative state. I think that the, how the justices feel about abortion will be the primary animating factor, whether they sort of acknowledge that forthrightly in their opinion or not. Important, important point there. James and Shauna, thank you very much for being with us. We really appreciate your time. And coming up, Marjorie Taylor Greene is looking to oust Mike Johnson as House Speaker. Does he need to be worried? We'll dig into that with our the political one panel. I would give You're streaming to the America Decides. And to the Speaker is, do not be fearful of a motion to vacate. I do not think they could do it again. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh! 
<laughs> and reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Todd. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Multiple to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da -da -da. and truly original That's reporting. Cool. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. At this moment, terrorists could be plotting another attack. 9-11 triggered a counter-terrorist system that included a secret database. This person needs a closer look. A growing list of nearly 2 million people, including some Americans who say they're innocent. For one hour flight, I have to spend six hours to go and come back. CBS Reports explores the system, the people responsible for it, and those pushing for change. I'm not fighting against them. I'm fighting for them to do the right thing. The Watch List, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Don't miss true crime anytime you want, anywhere you go, with the 48 Hours Podcast. Real crimes, real lives, real justice. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Listen to 48 Hours on Apple Podcasts. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Imagine yourself in Manhattan with no police, no army, no mayor. The people of Haiti stare down poverty, corruption, natural disasters, and violence. 90% of the guns that are used by gangs in Haiti are American guns. But with an unbreakable spirit and eternal optimism. There are days where I cry, but we can't be discouraged. We still believe in Haiti. They're still able to look ahead with hope. Haiti is on the brink of transformation, a radical shift. Asians are coming together and saying things must change. Fighting for Haiti, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Everybody wakes up in the morning and they are pelted with alerts that frighten them, news that agitates them. With this show, we have the time to explain what's going on. These migrants, they've been released. Explain the status that allows them to be released, to slow things down a little bit. What are the big sets of questions for China and its ambitions? Hackers are stepping up their attacks to extort victims. Let's start with easy. Who's attacking? Here's a deeper understanding of what's happening. Prime Time with John Dickerson. Stream on the free CBS News app. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. On our places, bright, shiny faces. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings. Welcome back to America Decides. Kevin McCarthy, who lost the speaker's gavel due to Republican resistance, is downplaying Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene's motion to oust the current House Speaker, Mike Johnson. Here's what he had to say on Face the Nation. I don't think Speaker Johnson's afraid at all, and I don't believe um, the motion will come up. Well, the, the motion Marjorie put in was not privileged, so it's not, it's right. not being called up for a vote. I, I don't think the Democrats will go along with this either. Um, we're close to the election. We watched what transpired the last time. Well, we will see about that with our political <laughs> panel. Hogan Gidley and Chuck Rocha join us now. Hogan previously served as White House Deputy Press Secretary in the Trump administration, and Chuck previously served as Senior Campaign Advisor to Bernie Sanders' 2022, 2020, 2020 presidential campaign. Um, and Major is here as well. Uh, of I course. never leave. You never know, leave. I just, yeah. You can't we're, get rid of me no matter what you try, Katie. Okay, you cannot get rid of me. <laughs> never leave. Um, <laughs> Let's start with you, Hogan. This motion to vacate, where it feels like Groundhog Day all over again, <laughs> will this really, you know, should Johnson really be concerned? No. Uh, look, there are plenty of conservatives out there who are always concerned about these situations because for whatever reason, we govern up until the precipice, this big chasm, this cliff, and then all of a sudden, all the conservatives have to just say, okay, we'll vote the way we don't want to vote just because you guys mishandled the whole management situation. But regardless of whoever the speaker is, whether it be McCarthy or Jim Jordan or, or Johnson, the fact is political realities exist here. They do not control the Senate and they do not control the White House. We only control the House and it's by a slim margin. So these types of things are good for political fodder, but I don't really think they're going to move the ball at all. And Chuck, as Patty Murray said at the conclusion of last week's business, she, the head of the Senate Appropriations Committee, the deal that we're now passing was essentially the deal available five months ago. 
Right. Nothing has changed except a lot of back and forth that accomplished almost nothing for House Republicans and those conservative stalwarts who wanted to accomplish more because of those same underlying legislative realities. Well, a lot of things have changed, which is a lot of speakers and a lot of elections and a lot of elections and a lot of elections for speaker. And what that says to Democrats is a lot of dysfunction. Even the Republicans admit that in the House, like there's a lot of fighting going on amongst themselves in the House. And it don't look good for them when you can, as a Democrat, run commercial saying that they can't even get along with themselves. And Marjorie Taylor Greene knows what she's doing. She's going to raise a lot of money off of this. She's going to get lots of attention. And we were just talking about this in the green room. It's like she hasn't called for the speakership. She just could, if she wanted to, would put her in the catbird seat where she She's the one controlling Congress, not the speaker. She's the one with the power, and I think that's probably the problem here. But truthfully, Hogan, the Democrats have as much influence over the House legislative trajectory as Republicans do, because everything that comes to the floor now comes on a suspension calendar, meaning it has to have two-thirds majority, meaning you have to know the Democrats are going to vote for it in the first place. Why? Because if Republicans bring a rule on something only they want, they can't even keep their own side together. So effectively, they've ceded partial control of the House to Democrats. Yeah, they have. And look, the margins, as we talked about, were slim to, to, to begin with. But you're talking about a two-thirds majority vote here, which is obviously difficult to do in any circumstance in today's Washington, D.C., in today's political climate. So again, these are issues that the Republicans in the House understand are going to be problematic for them moving forward, not just to get something passed, but also to bring the American people alongside them. That is always the issue when you're talking about the House of Representatives. Um, let's talk about the Trump trials. Um, Hogan, I'm curious how, how you're thinking about this, because earlier we were talking about how during the primary campaign, uh, this was something that really galvanized Republican voters uh, to Donald Trump's side. Moving into a general election now, should he be concerned about any of the legal consequences he's facing? Look. There's a long way between now and November. I mean, it's a political eternity, no question about that. Right now, it looks like a lot of these cases tend to be falling apart, which really accentuates some of the things he's been talking about as it relates to a weaponized government against him, against a political opponent, election interference, two-tier justice system. Things he's been talking about are now kind of playing themselves out in the court. Whether a conviction comes or not, I really don't think that's the less design here. Because, of course, they'd like that. That's a cherry on top of this Sunday. But what they want to do is muddy the waters so that anybody out there thinking about going back to the Republican Party and voting for someone who had America First policies and those agenda items that improve their lives, they don't want any of the drama. That's the purpose of these things, to try and muddy that for voters out there who are really considering a switch uh, when they know how bad Joe Biden has been so far as president. Chuck, weigh in on that, please. Okay. Look, at the end of the day, we've never seen anything like this. I've been running campaigns for 34 years. I was on a presidential campaign where my candidate had a heart attack. I still haven't seen anything like this. So we don't know. We're all pontificating. Will this hurt him? Most people are like, if a, somebody gets in, uh, gets in trouble in the court system, you think it would hurt them if they're running for president. But when he got indicted, how much money did he raise? It helped him a lot, raise a lot of money. And the one thing I'm keeping my eye on, because it's about the money, is how much money is the RNC and his campaign going to have to pay in legal bills? Is one less commercial they have to run against Joe Biden, which I think is a good thing for Democrats. Or it's less yeah. money down ballot for yeah. Republicans. Great running point. Senate races, governor yeah. races, House races. Sure. Because as of late last week, there's now a determination. Committee 47 takes money. It goes mm -hmm. straight to Save America PAC, then it goes to the Republican National Committee, and, meaning and, those legal bills are first in line, sure. not down-ballot Republicans. But, it, but again, it's not just, although I did say, it's not just to muddy the waters, it's also to bleed him dry financially, to prevent him from using uh, his bully pulpit to get cash in the door, to help those down-ballot races, and to hurt him as well. We're already going to be outspent probably 10 to 1 in this whole thing, but Trump could obviously stroke a check if he wanted to, but if you're bleeding him dry with court case after court case, then it's going to be a problem, obviously. Was it Alvin manage. Bragg's fault that he wrote checks to uh, Michael Cohen for a false business entity to keep Stormy Daniels quiet? Was it what now? Was it Alvin Bragg's fault that that happened? No, this is not about that. This is about going after a political opponent. Look, it, look, Donald Trump had been a businessman in this country for decades. No one ever went after his businesses. No one ever went after these things until he won for president. And then he's winning again. And now he's ahead in all these swing states. Shock of shocks. They're bringing a wave of trials on various topics in this election year to try and uh, ha hamper his ability to win this, uh, this election. Jack, you want to weigh in on that? Look, at the end of the day, 
This is a long time before the election, and the American people are now starting to tune into this thing. A year ago, we were talking about this same thing. They really weren't, but now they are. And in focus group after focus groups, folks are starting to pay attention because it's getting into summertime, and they know elections coming up. So if you're Biden, are you talking about this, or do you just let this play out and you focus on? <laughs> Look, I know I'm just an old Mexican on. redneck from East Texas, but when somebody's <laughs> digging themselves a hole, you don't take the shovel away from them. You let them keep on a digging, and that's what's happening. And you're going to see him going to Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, talking about the good things, talking about how the stock market's at an all-time high. He's going to keep talking about the things he's done to deliver. And you're not going to see him say that much about the Donald Trump court cases. Does this Hogan... The reality that for starting on April 15th, for about six weeks, former President Trump's going to have to be in the courtroom. Yeah. Does that materially affect his ability to campaign? Well, again, because we would argue these are political prosecutions, political persecutions, you could, he would use, argue that that, to, right. you could use that to your advantage. And no question, if anyone could do that, it's Donald Trump, as you just talked about. Chuck, he's raising a ton of money off of this but also to accentuate what's going on. There are plenty of people in this country who feel as though the government is weaponized against them. He's the tip of that spear. He's got the bully pulpit. He's able to say the things that a lot of people feel in this country. He's the voice for the voiceless. He was in 2016. He is now at this point in time, too. These court cases are going to be going on, obviously, throughout the entire spring. They could go all the way up until the election. The Trump campaign's pushing for delays, of course. But the fact of the matter is he's going to continue to say he did nothing wrong. He's going to continue to say these people are going after me because I'm winning in the polls. It looks like election interference. And that's going to be the election. We're arguing these types of things on this panel, but we'll be arguing these in public as well. And where the American people fall on it right now, because this isn't happening in a vacuum, it's happening up against the policies that Joe Biden has put in place that have kicked the American people in the teeth for three years. Then we've got a different argument. The biggest, the biggest difference here is that when Donald Trump ran the last time, people didn't know what to expect from Donald Trump. I think that's going to be the biggest difference now. Whether you love him or you hate him, they know what they're going to get if they reelected. Right. All right. Well, we do have a while to go, so we shall see as we say. Um, Hogan and Chuck, thank you very much. And Major Garrett, thank you for being tied down here and staying the whole time. We appreciate it. And that does it for us today. We'll be back with another edition of America Decides tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern. You're streaming CBS News. So let's just start at the beginning. Well, let me start with this. What is at stake here? What is the answer then? Do you know why? You want me to just keep going? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Were there 